The last few videos discussed several methods that geneticists and other biologists use to analyze DNA. And now we come back to the question that motivated this chapter. How do individuals differ genetically and how do we find those differences? We'll discuss four different classes of DNA marker and as a bonus, we'll encounter another modern way of analyzing them. So we've discussed how restriction enzymes can cut at defined sequences. Let's say that person A, here's a stretch of their genome, has an ECOR1 restriction site at a locus. And remember that's G-A-A-T-T-C. Let's say that that's right there. But in person B at that locus, one of those bases is changed. Let's say G-A-G-T-T-C. So now, if we use PCR to amplify this stretch of the genome in both people, and we take these two PCR fragments, and we add the ECOR1 restriction enzyme and run it on a gel, what are we going to see? Well. Person A will have ECOR1 cut here, right? And so we'll have two short fragments show up on our gel, but person B won't have this PCR, um, this PCR amplicon, this DNA cut by ECOR1. And so they'll just have one large fragment on that gel. These kinds of DNA markers are known as restriction length, sorry, restriction fragment length polymorphisms. Common agree, abbre commonly abbreviated RFLP, right? And you can see how this name applies to this situation, right? Because the polymorphism, this single nucleotide change, has changed the length of these restriction fragments. You can find them with PCR. You can also find them with southern blotting. And usually, an RFLP like this is just caused by a single base change. And that makes them a subcategory of a much larger class of DNA marker called a single nucleotide polymorphism. And just as we abbreviate this RFLP, we abbreviate this SNP, but we also pronounce this one SNP, SNPs. And again, SNPs are just places where a single base differs between individuals. For example, if I have an A and you have a G. And as we saw when we discussed mutations, that if, it's, if that polymorphism shows up in a protein coding gene, it can have a dramatic impact on that protein's function. However, protein coding sequences only make up about 1% of the human genome, and so most SNPs aren't in genes. Approximately 10 million uh, common SNPs have been identified in humans, and we could go looking for them by just sequencing a person's genome. Right, And that process is a lot faster and a lot less expensive than it was a decade ago, but it is still not fast and it is still not cheap. And so instead, we can use a technology called a DNA microarray to probe just the locations of known SNPs to determine a person's genotype at all of these different loci. And our next video discusses this technology, which has become absolutely foundational to modern genetics.